You are tuned in to What Up Baltimore online radio. Please note that the views and opinions expressed on this channel are of the host and not of Lady J Media. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, What Up Baltimore TV. And if you really don't want to miss any of the shows, hit that notification bell and you'll get a message every time we come on. Now we got it from here, so sit back, relax, and stay tuned. My name is Pastor Shannon Wright, and this is Real Talk Around the Kitchen Table. We've got some serious issues facing our cities all around the country. And this Real Talk Around the Kitchen Table will have some real talk with some real people, with some real solutions for all of our issues. So join us Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pastor Shannon Wright with Real Talk Around the Kitchen Table. Hope to see you then. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. For all of our viewers and listeners, please forgive the scratchiness of my voice. I am truly dedicated to the cause. I am remote because, well, you know, kind of kind of keep people around me safe. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but we've got some serious issues going on in our state right now that are of a time sensitive nature. And, you know, it just, you gotta do what you gotta do. And I'm, I'm grateful and, and blessed and honored to have with us as our first guest today, uh, Maryland State Delegate Jeff Brist. You are a busy man. You're on several different committees and subcommittees and all that, but there is one particular bill that you are really kind of shepherding and spearheading right now that I'd really love for you to introduce to us and so we could talk about for a few minutes. Sure. Um, it's the Right to Learn Act. This is a bill we had in last year, um, and it's sort of, I guess it was a really a, trust, a test run for this year because um, we're, we're making a heck of a lot more traction this year and we're getting a lot of really um, good press and um, and at the ground, grassroots level, um, especially in those school districts that are most affected, um, the word's getting out that this is um, this is a bill that has to pass. And you're absolutely right about timing. So um, a lot of folks, I don't know if they're familiar with the boost program. Um, so this was established in 2017. Uh, through the budget, uh, what didn't require a bill or anything. Um, so they carved out um, at that time, I believe it was, I think it was $8 million and it's grown mm -hmm. to 10 million last year. And um, this, and then what um, the legislature has done um, is they want to, because, and I, I believe it's coming from the teachers unions, MSEA, uh, they don't believe that we should be using state uh, taxpayer money to offer alternative education for our students. Uh, and there's families who um, are in uh, failing public schools, um, or at least where the families feel like that the public schools are failing them. And what this does is it provides a lifeline. Um, so it, it does, it gives them a scholarship, it gives them a grant uh, to go to either a, um, a, a charter school or, or a parochial school um, as an alternative. And mm -hmm. we have about 3,000 students uh, across Maryland who are taking advantage of this program. Um, and it's income based. Um, so, um, you know, we're, you know, these aren't, you know, rich kids um, who have, who, where their families can afford to send their kid to a private school. Um, these are kids who are on the free and reduced meals. Um, these are kids who are stuck in a, in a really bad situation um, and there aren't that many options. Um, and so this is a program that works. Uh, if you talk to any of the parents, um, they'll tell you for a lot of reasons. One, uh, the education is better. Um, they're, they're, their kids are safer. Um, and also, too, from the social piece, um, there's a lot more uh, integration as well, um, because in a lot of these private schools, um, it, there's a lot more economic diversity um, there as well. Um, so it's not only good for the students who go there, but it's also good for, um, you know, the, the, the kids who are, um, who are already attending those schools as well. It's just, it's just a win win all the way around. I, there's nothing. Nobody's even saying there's anything wrong with the program. They just don't like the public money going to private schools. Right. And I get that. We don't care about that. We don't even want to talk about that. What I want to talk about, because I am in agreement with you that the program works. I'm in agreement with you that the program is, necess is a necessity. Um, I also understand that without this bill passing, the program could go away. 
It so absolutely doesn't go away, yeah. What we need to know, we need to know, is how we can help you make sure that the boost program does not go away. The biggest thing now, um, and and it's a it's a huge uphill battle for me because I am um, a member of the uh, the minority party um, and uh, the Republican Party. We're outnumbered two to one, and unfortunately for us, we really don't control public policy in Maryland. Um, mm -hmm. and, unfortunately, so for us, um, when we have legislation that, that really does mean something and it's very important to the residents of Maryland. It's critically important for us to get our message out um, to the residents of Maryland. And it's not to my folks back home. They agree with me. Um, and, and I'm from the Eastern Shore. Um, it's, it's for us to get the message out to, um, you know, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Howard County, Baltimore City, um, especially because that's where the vast majority of our, our failing schools are. Um, right. It's up to those folks who live in those districts to call your legislator. That, that's the that's the only way this bill is going to pass is if you if enough people call their legislators and, and let them know how important this bill really is. And we're only talking about two million dollars. Now, let's talk about that for a second, mm -hmm. folks, for my parents that are listening right now. If you have children that are in Baltimore City schools that are one of those 23 schools with zero students proficient in math, you should be going online and Googling how to reach your representatives in Annapolis to be able to get them to support this bill, to, to codify and enshrine boost so it doesn't go away, to increase the budget. I mean, let's not, let's not even just talk about the little, the scraps and corners. We don't wanna just keep boost, we wanna expand boost. Um, and I'm gonna say this, Delegate Grist mentioned politics and minority parties and all that. I'm telling y'all, forget about that. We don't care about that. What you should care about is your children getting a quality education. It doesn't matter who it comes from, what party it comes from. Listen, let's all work together to get these children a positive, beneficial, worthwhile education. Right now, for most of my parents in Baltimore City, and y'all know this to be true, and if you don't, shame on you, need to Google it. If your child is one of the children that makes it to a quote graduation, that graduation certificate won't be worth the paper or the tree that died to print it because it has not been a secret that Baltimore schools, too many of them are failing and they're failing our children and children are being pushed through with social promotion, unable to be in a place where they can compete on a, a national, much less global scale. So this program is a tool and a resource to help some families. Now, there's folks ask, well, what about Kerwin? And that's coming and that's it. Kerwin is gonna take some years to implement Right here, right now, Boost is what parents have as a resource to be able to get their children out of a failing situation into a positive situation where they can learn, where they can grow, where they can they can just be what all parents want for their children. So, delegate, tell us. So, we need folks to reach out to their their delegates. And, and put pressure on them. Now, if I'm understanding correctly, the bill is gone for its first reading and it's in committee. So even before that, we need to help see what we can do to help push it out of committee. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So it's in ways and means. It had its hearing last week. And mm -hmm. so in order for that bill to pass, they have to actually go to a vote in committee. Um, and mm -hmm. oftentimes what they'll do is the chair of the committee won't even allow the committee to vote on it. They'll just keep it at the bill in the drawer. Um, so Delegate Atterbury is the chair of uh, the Ways and Means Committee. And so it's her decision of whether or not um, this bill will even get a vote. Um, and if she decides to get a vote, then it's important that we reach out to the other members of the committee as well, uh, that they vote favorably um, on this. So if I'm understanding, just to, just to paraphrase a little bit, kind of translate things, yep. um, Delegate Atterbury, um, she is the chairwoman of the Ways and Means Committee Correct. and has the authority to bring this bill forward for a vote to move it forward at a committee. That's correct. Now, let me just say this. Today is March 1st, which means we have ended Black History Month and we are starting Women's History Month. And I cannot imagine that a woman who understands 10, 20 years ago, it would have been nearly impossible to be chairman of a committee of the state delegation would do something as egregious and harmful to our babies 
as to stop them from getting a quality education. Certainly not at this time of women's history and empowerment. I, I, you know what? I, I'm encouraging all of our listeners and viewers to reach out to Delegate Atterbury and to, to, to Chairwoman of the Ways and Means Committee Atterbury to explain to her that you merely want to support her in making the right decision to support all of our babies. And I, if I could make a suggestion, well, when you do, um, always be as respectable as you possibly can, and just say, oh, you know, what? we we support we support group parent. I, I'm I'm in my district right now trying to figure out how we're going to do three year old pre K. You know, I want to see Kerwin come to fruition, but you're absolutely right. See, the thing is, these kids can't wait. By the time these kids are going to yeah. benefit from Kerwin and the blueprint, they're going to be already graduated. I'm hoping they're going to graduate. Some may not graduate because. Um, these schools are failing them and they don't have this lifeline. Um, the time is time is the essence here. This is our this really is our one. I would say it's our only one and only shot. We'll bring it back next year, but that might be too late. And it will be for some of these children, yeah. because when you look at. OK, let's take this from a societal perspective right now. When you look at Baltimore City and I, I live in Baltimore, so I'm going to talk specifically about Baltimore. When you look at the reports about the schools with students with zero proficiency, 23 with zero proficiency in math, and then another 20 with one or two students proficient. Then you look at the amount of GO students. Well, then you look at the grade changing. Then you look at the squeegee issue and how many of these young men on the corners are saying they would be in school if they thought the school was something that was gonna actually benefit them, meaning if our schools were working. So you wanna fix Baltimore? Fix the schools, That's give right. the parents the tools and resources to be able to hang in there so Kerwin can be properly implemented. Keep these young folks off the streets, in the classrooms, bring down crime, bring up educational outcomes, turn around economic outlooks. That's how you lower crime. That's how you fix our city and by extension, our state. So if folks wanna ask questions delegate to you specifically in terms of the bill, in terms of um, are there specific, what's the best way for people to reach out and help? Let me just put it that way. Actually, I'll give you my cell phone number. How about that? If you can call me on that or send me a text message, um, it's four one. write it down. Anybody can, who's listening, write it down. 410-829-5163. This bill means enough to me where you can call me personally anytime and, and, and talk to me about it or send me a text message. Now, okay, folks, I got to interrupt for a second. <laughs> name of this show is real talk and I'm gonna keep this real real for a minute mm -hmm. delegate Chris who I have never met personally just earned a lot of street cred as far as I'm concerned because this man believes so much in this bill forget delegate this man believes so much in this bill to educate our children that he was willing to share his cell number with y'all I'm not sharing my cell number so let's be real clear this bill is important this delegate believes in it and if you have children, you ought to believe in it and you ought to be supporting it. Whether you already have your children in a school that is successful, whether you have your children in private school, understand this. If you live in Western Maryland or the Eastern Shore, reach out to your delegate. If you don't want to support this, do one thing. Ask your delegate how much of the annual budget that they vote on goes to support Baltimore City. And then rethink that whether you want to get involved and in something that'll actually have a positive benefit, not just from an educational standpoint, but from a financial and fiscal standpoint for your own pocket as well, based on your taxes that support Baltimore City. So I try to get people to understand Baltimore is all of our issue, whether you live in Baltimore or not. And I think until people really understand that, it might be a little bit challenging. So I'm, I'm trying to hammer that point home. Um, so, Delegate, let me ask you, when you all do your budget, and, and if you and if I'm wrong, you can make a liar out of me. It's OK. <laughs> um, would you say that there are a lot of programs, a lot of funding, a lot of issues, a lot of things that go to try and support Baltimore City? Yes, a lot. Uh, we have a um, I mean, Maryland has a very and it's not, not just Baltimore City. This these there are so many programs that are available. Um, to every Maryland resident who need it. Um, I think it's uh, legislative service. They put a book out. I think it's about 65 pages of, um, of, of social programs and they're important programs. Um, and, um, but the, the lion's share really does go to Baltimore city and I, and I support them. I'm not, I'm not opposed to any of those programs um, whatsoever. Um, and I, and I'm also supporting the blueprint as well. Um, and, that, and that's sort of where our frustration is too. Um, you know, when we live in other parts of the state, 
we want Baltimore. We want Baltimore to thrive. I mean, Baltimore City was, you know, um, one of the best cities in the country not that long ago. Um, wow. and, mm-hmm. and it won't bring, and, and it, I don't know that it's going to take much to bring Baltimore City back to where it used to be, you know, and um, and we want that. I, I think that's a that's a unified voice all across the state, no matter where you live. Um, I but agree. we're spending so much money in it, we're not seeing the results, and it's so frustrating for for all of us. I would agree. I I believe we have another guest that's going to be joining us. Um, and, and I'm hopeful maybe we can bring her on now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm okay today. How are you? I am well, thank you, folks. This is de- this delegate. She and I spoke for the first time yesterday. And the passion and the, the, the energy behind this bill is what kind of got me motivated and encouraged to, to reach out and engage and really try to be a part of the solution. Delegate Munoz, please tell us, we're talking about the, 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 the right to learn. I, I hope I said that right. That's okay. Um, tell us what brought, what made you so passionate about this bill? Well, I, I so appreciate you taking the time, you know, to discuss this with us and sort of share the message because I am a mother of five little ones. And that's my number one job, you know, attorney, delegate, whatever else I do, my number one job is being mom. And um, I went into this, you know, legislative sessions with a lot of goals and a lot of priorities. And then I very quickly found out about this boost cut Mm -hmm. in the governor's budget. And I just could not believe it. I could not believe that we were going to take scholarship money from our most vulnerable children from a program that is supporting a majority of minority students who are, you know, living in areas of our state, every corner of our state, Mm -hmm. and their parents have deemed it necessary to send them, you know, to to an alternative school for their own good and their own well-being. And, you know, with everything we heard on the campaign trail, I just could not believe Governor Moore was not interested in supporting them anymore. And in fact, wanted to reduce his, you know, the budget and and plan to phase it out completely. And so I was just flabbergasted. And as a mother, I was offended. And as a delegate for, for my constituents, the children and the families in my district and all across the state of Maryland, um, I just thought, well, this is definitely a hill worth dying on. I would agree. So, and it's very interesting, and I'm glad you said this. Um, we have a governor that just, one um, who campaigned on leaving no one behind. Mm-hmm. Now, if there is a singular scholarship program that benefits low-income families around the state, and you want to cut that budget by twenty percent, to me, that's leaving a whole bunch of folk behind. Because, it is. and and what I, and forgive me, you know, I, I'm not a math scholar, but. If you're willing to spend half a billion dollars from the state's surplus on a wish and a prayer that Kerwin will work at some point in a few years down the road, what is the difference? What, what, why, why would you take 2 million from something that's working now? Exactly. That's the part I'm trying to wrap my brain around. And I, I'm not a scholar, so maybe it's, you know, a little bit above me. That's, that's possible. But I will tell you this. Parents don't have time to wait for the hope and a prayer that Kerwin is going to work. Parents yeah. need quality education for their children now. Parents in zip codes with schools that are failing need an option because if you're concerned about crime in Baltimore now, give it another couple of years, a couple of more generations, and, and would have been, should have been graduation classes that don't graduate and aren't equipped to, to really function in the real world. Mm-hmm. And you will see where crime is going to be in our city. It's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And that's the piece. Our budget is enormous. And Delegate Greist is actually an expert on the numbers. And I, I I went to law school. And so we joke, we, you know, everyone goes to law school because they can't do math. But I can tell you that this program since its inception has helped over 20,000 Maryland students, like achieve that dream to get that education to be in a safe school. And, and succeed and, and reach their potential. And it is such a small part of the budget. I don't understand why it's us versus them. I don't understand why we have to 
you know, put so many billion dollars into public schools, which like Delegate Greith said, is a noble goal. We, we, we want our public schools to succeed. We want them to be better than they are today. But yes. why do we have to take away that option? I, and I, I just jumped out of a, a subcommittee meeting and I'm running to a bill hearing. So I, I missed uh, everything Delegate Greist had to say. But something he actually said in our press conference last night has just it pierced me through the heart and it stuck with me because he said. Maryland has school choice. And it's available only to the rich. See, I heard that quote and and please um, hopefully since delegate, you, you didn't go to law school, delegate Gris, um, you won't sue me because I'm going to use that phrase because it is really quite accurate. It um, is. It's not fair. No, it's not. It's not. Um, and one other point I will make is mm -hmm. I don't know if people have really talked about this very much um, because it, it kind of gets personal, right? Like we're, we're not supposed to get very personal when we're discussing legislation. But mm -hmm. if you walk through the halls of the state capitol, the Maryland General Assembly, the House, the Senate, I would venture to guess more often than not, the people working here and making these decisions for Maryland families, they send their children to private schools. Of course they do. <laughs> of course they do. Um, you know, my husband and I raised four children and we couldn't afford four sets of tuition to private school. So we made the decision to give up an income and we actually homeschooled our kids through high school. Um, but not everybody has the ability to make that decision either. Um, and, and can afford to Single make Single parents? Decision. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's, that's not an option. So mm -hmm. this boost program is that option for them right now. It's a lifeline, um, yeah. It's perfect choice of words, it, it really is. So we've covered that um, we need Everybody in the sound of this broadcast, first of all, if you're watching this, I need you to copy the link and I need you to share it with all of your friends, family, coworkers, your network far and wide and ask them to share as well. And we need to encourage all of you to politely and respectfully reach out to Delegate Adbury to help her find her way to bring this bill to a vote. We need it out of committee. Maryland has a very short legislative session. We're in March. The session ends next month. So let's help encourage, positively encourage, Delegate Atterbury to be able to do the job um, of service that, that everyone down there was elected to do and bring this bill forward, especially now. All my moms, first day of women's history month. This makes some history. Encourage Delegate Atterbury, bring this bill forward bring it up for a vote and let's move this forward and do the right thing for all of our children. In this. I can add one more thing very quickly. Um, if we can do just that, um, I've been here for eight years and I think there's only been one, maybe two bills that made it out of committee and died on the floor. If it comes out of committee, it's almost pretty much a done deal. If that bill will pass and it'll be signed on by the governor, hopefully. Uh, the, the key right now, the hardest part is getting it out of committee. And, and Delegate Atterbury is the final say on where this bill goes. Okay, so we know what we have to do. We have to reach our homeschooling moms. We have to reach our moms and dads that have children that are in these failing schools. We have to reach these parents and we have to get them to reach Delegate Adam. Is yeah, there anything absolutely. else that you would like to share from a perspective of the benefit of this bill? Um, the, the hopes that not only will this bill pass and it'll be codified, but actually expanded. Do we want to push the envelope and talk a little bit about what real education choice needs to look like in Maryland, how we fix our schools, any of that, or would you like to just leave it set right here on this bill? And I'll leave that up to you too. I would say let's, let's preserve boost right now. Um, okay. and let's not bite off more than, than, than we can chew. This is a, this is a heavy lift and we want to keep it as light mm -hmm. as we can this session. That would be my suggestion. Okay. It is. And we thank you so much for taking the time and, and taking up this issue because when things like this happen here in Annapolis, when light isn't shed on them, when when people aren't aware and they can kind of be these, these types of actions that to us make absolutely no sense, you know, taking funding from the most vulnerable children in our entire state. Right. Who would do that? Like who would make that choice? But, but choices like that are made every day. 
here in Annapolis. And if no one knows about it, if no one sheds light on it, you know, if it's if, easier to be callous in the dark than it is in the light of day. So we need to shine a bright light. We do. Well, and, sure. and when people are aware and they start speaking up and their voices are heard, we're we're not supposed to be dictators. We're representatives and we're supposed to do the work of the people. And so, I mean, I don't think anyone could with, you know, any level of integrity actually make this choice if they knew you know, who was going to be harmed and the fact that Marylanders just just absolutely say no. Absolutely. You know, folks, this is about preserving the future for our most vulnerable children from our low income and challenged families. That's what this is about. This isn't about Republican or Democrat. This right. isn't about whether you like this person, whether you like that person, what do you think? No. This is not about the unions. This is about children. So for anyone that has the argument of you're taking money from the public schools, the public schools are robbing the failing public schools because there is a difference. The failing public schools are robbing our children of their future. And this, this program helps to level that playing field just a little bit. So um, I'm, I'm really grateful and appreciative to both of you coming on. I know that you all are, are, your days are packed between committee and subcommittee and meetings for the meetings, about the meetings and, and all of that. So I, I really do appreciate you both taking the time to be here today. Um, we will keep in touch. We will follow this. Um, and I will encourage everyone that's seeing this, that's listening to again, share, to reach out to Delegate Atterbury to bring this bill out of, out of committee. Um, bring it for a vote and out of committee, and also to your delegates that once it is out of committee, that they vote to support this. This is all of our children's future at stake, which definitely impacts our state as a whole. Doesn't matter if you live in a poor performing school district area or not, it impacts all of Maryland. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Folks, listen, um, we're already at March 1st, so we don't really have a lot of time. The legislative session in Maryland ends, I believe, literally next month. So we don't have a lot of time to really be able to get this to a vote, out of committee, to the floor, to really be able to move forward. So if you're a parent that has a child in one of those 23 zero proficiency schools in Baltimore City or the other 20 with one or two students proficient, you need to be asking your delegate, where are you and why am I not seeing you in support of this bill? Why is it, <clears throat> why come? I'm not seeing any faces and hearing any names of the Baltimore City delegation that are supporting an immediate action to be able to support our children. We have another guest with us and we're gonna talk about some of the positive if we can fix education and some of the negative, if we can't with, with a young lady that is very well, very well, I can't even speak today, very well versed on the social and socioeconomic impacts of good education and the implications from a bad one. So we have, we have another guest joining us right about now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. So now I want to give you an opportunity, please, to introduce yourself to our audience in the manner in which you would like to be. I know some folks are titles and this and that. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. My name is Latoya Congolo, and I am a licensed clinical social worker and licensed clinical drug and alcohol counselor. Okay. Now, let's get right at it. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of talk in Maryland right now um, about schools sliding in performance across the board, and then specifically in Baltimore, in PG County, parts of Montgomery County, our urban centers. And, and what I'd like, we talked earlier in the show with Delegate um, Jeff Grist and, and Delegate Munoz about what um, the Maryland Right to Learn Bill is, how to support it. But what I wanna talk to, to you about, I want, I want our listeners to understand the negative implications if we don't fix our public schools, 
and the positive implications when we do fix our public schools. So which one would you like to start with first? Well, I mean, I, I always want to start with the, uh, the uh, positive because I'm a very hopeful person. Okay. Um, I, what I can say is, is that we know that, that education is an ultimate equalizer. Um, it decreases poverty, it decreases uh, criminality, it decreases teenage pregnancy, suicidal ideations. There's so much tied to the uh, social and emotional impact of a child when they have a quality educational system intact. However, you see the opposite effects. And unfortunately, our system today is really straying away from everything that will um, set a child up for a trajectory of um, a good education, a good career, um, be, being able to break the cycles of poverty, and also feeling good about themselves. Our confidence, our self-esteem comes from us being challenged, comes from us being accomplished and having certain accomplishments in life. But mm -hmm. in a failing system, what is that going to do to you mentally, spiritually, emotionally? It's going to mm -hmm. add to hopelessness. You know, it, it, it decreases a person's ability to be able to see themselves beyond their current circumstances. It, it has so many negative impacts. And if we don't fix this broken system, we're going to continue to have broken children. Amen to that. That's absolute. Thank you for putting. See, this is why I needed you here. You, you put that in a way that people could get. It's about more than a scholarship. It's about more than sending your children to a brick and mortar square place. It's about their future. It's about your family's future which by extension, the families are the cornerstones and the building blocks of our communities and our neighborhoods. So by fixing the schools, I believe, and statistics show and studies show, and you've just summed it up, by fixing the schools, you fix families, neighborhoods, and communities. Right, and when you don't, I'm sorry, I'm just saying when you don't, you see the impact in terms of crime, in terms of, of, of Crimes and ways and people, desperation crimes. I, I, that's, I see people doing things now because they don't feel they have a future. They don't feel they have a hope that I don't think folks would do if they felt there was a chance for them and their children to have a better future. And I completely agree. We have to look at where children spend most of their time. They spend most of their time at home and most of their time at school. Consider a child that has a dysfunctional home life and they go to a chaotic school where they don't feel safe, living in a community where they don't feel safe, going home to a home where they don't feel safe. What do you think the impact is going to be on that child emotionally, mentally, spiritually even? Absolutely. Absolutely. So from folks that are listening, that are folks of faith, um, to those that, if you know something, you, you're more expected to do something. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to ask again for everyone that is watching this, that is listening to this, to copy the link, to share this, and then to ask the people you share it with to share it again. We need to exponentially share this show, not for the ratings, not for the network, but for the, the hope of helping to get this bill passed of hope of getting resources for parents to be able to get their children into properly performing schools now, as opposed to down the road. Right, right. We're in a crisis. We, we don't have time to waste. This starts now. It should have, it, 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 this, this needed to be in place and expanded upon, but now mm -hmm. they're deciding to cut it. That mm -hmm. to me is the one system that has been proven to work where we have data where these children are going on and they have higher success rates than any Baltimore City public school. Why are we getting rid of that problem? I mean, getting rid of that solution to a problem. Exactly. That is, that's a solution that we know is working and we're moving so far away from everything. It's just, it's really disheartening for me as a mental health therapist who have treated thousands of kids over the years and even as a mother myself. So now you said something interesting and because of your background, I wanna go back to it. You said, why would we get rid of something that is clearly a solution to a problem? Right. Now, right. in my cynical side, which I try to keep 
definitely the minority side because I'd rather be optimistic as opposed to cynical. But I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, folks that don't want to do better, that want to control budgets, that don't really care about outcomes, want to squash what is good so it takes the light off of what's not good. So because we're seeing, case in point, the, the, the story of the last couple of weeks in Baltimore City about the charter school that was up for review and whether or not they were going to get their, their charter renewed because they were having some, quote, administrative issues. Mm -hmm. Their graduation rate is maybe 20 percent higher than the city. Mm -hmm. Their success rate is a whole bunch higher than the city. But now what did the city do? Instead of coming in to say, okay, you know what? We're going to build you up as a shining example. No, we're going to tear you down. And we're not going to hold the rest of our public schools to the standard we're going to hold you to because you, you know, you diverting our money, you, you in our pocket. And yeah, I'm going to say it. Education right now is a business. It is an industry. Each one of you with a child enrolled in Baltimore City Public Schools is not a child. You are a $21,000 check. Now, if you want to make sure that your child actually gets a little bit of return on that, then, then there's some things you need to do to support this bill and quality education for all of our children. Mm -hmm. Because right now, the important thing that I'm seeing is to protect the money stream. I'm not seeing that same force and impact to protect our children's future. And that is what needs to be the priority. Right. And, and if you think about it, you know, how does our, how does our government survive off of the war and the poor? And when you keep people in a broken educational system where they don't learn financial literacy, where they don't know how to establish credit or what they need to do in order to um, break the cycles of poverty that keeps people dependent. Dependency serves the government well, but Absolutely. we're here to fight against that. We're here to say enough is enough. Our children don't deserve this. We can't continue to go down this path of destroying people's lives and families' lives. We, we owe it to our children. They, we need a return on our investment. If we're investing so much in per Absolutely. child, what are we getting in return? Nothing. Absolutely. Just a, a broken child coming from a broken educational system. That's right. If we put the type of energy and effort into protecting these children's future that we want to put into protecting the unions, <laughs> we might have some quality education going on. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to me. We are in, in these areas, in these situations and in this crisis mode, we are so stuck between what, what is that um, um, fight or flight mm -hmm. and survival and desperation that we can't get to phrases and places like generational wealth. Right. Like legacy building. We yeah. can't, get to, you know what? For everybody that's watching this now, y'all ain't gonna like this is politically incorrect and I, I really don't care right now. We just finished Black History Month. I want all my black folks to actually sit here and think for a second. How many of the folks that we talk about during the last 28 days do you think would be happy about what we are allowing our elected leaders to do to us right now? How many of them do you think would be happy to know that their sacrifice of blood, sweat, and tears was for us to be in this situation with this failing education system? All of the folks, all of the students that fought and stood up in the South, that, that folks that stood up for Brown versus the Board of Education to want to know that we are here in this place today where we are letting people, we are letting the new master that looks like us be the ones with their feet on our necks now. That is unacceptable to me. You know, it should be unacceptable to all of us. I mean, I, what, we, what we're looking at now, it's not just the educational system. If you're talking about Black History Month, let's talk about the state of the Black family. And again, going back to my point where, you know, uh, kids spend most of their time at home or at school. But let's look at the, the, the homes now. You know, fatherlessness, the strongest predictor of whether a person will end up in prison is if they were raised by a single parent. The effects of fatherlessness increases the rate of youth suicide, teenage pregnancy, drug and alcohol use, uh, 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 criminality. We have to look at all of this because the, the protective factors, the, the, the three main protective factors um, to break the cycle of poverty is faith, family, and education. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, we got into this situation as far as I'm concerned as a society because we allowed, we abdicated a lot of our authority 
in our own homes and allowed the government to come in and do some things, make some plans and some arrangements for us that we're now waking up and saying, oh, crud, what did we do? What, what, what have we allowed ourselves to do? We've got five minutes, four and a half actually, to wrap this up. Um, one, you are, you not only practice, but you teach as well, correct? I do. I teach at Anne Arundel Community College in the uh, Human Services Department. And I also um, have a nationally accredited school where I teach uh, therapists and behavioral health professionals across the, the country um, to uh, obtain the credits that they need for um, certifications, licensure. Okay. Do you have your own private practice? I should have asked that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, work-life behavioral health and professional training. And uh, we're located in Glen Burnie, Maryland. And uh, people can reach us at um, worklifebhllc.com or um, they can go to our Facebook page, Work Life Behavioral Health, and you can follow us there and, and get additional contact information for us. Now, to be honest, I already knew that, but I wanted you to be able to share that with our listeners and viewers. Folks out there are, we, we got a lot of issues out there. We've got a lot of little crises that are kind of building up into a big crises. And mental health, behavioral health, and sciences is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And we have allowed ourselves to go so far from where we should be in terms of our family, in terms of our structure, in terms of how we raise our children, in terms of the things that we instill in our children, that, that we've got some work to get back where we should be. Right. Um, and I, I, again, the name of your, your firm? It's work life, work life, behavioral health and professional training. And right. can I just make this one point, Pastor Shannon? Yes, Long before I started my private practice, I worked in the child welfare system. I worked in a uh, youth detention center. I've worked in outpatient mental health addictions programs, residential programs. I have seen the same person, just a different name. These huh. are individuals who came from homes where they didn't have two supportive, loving biological parents. They didn't live in safe neighborhoods, most of them, majority of them. And they did not have adequate education, nor were their parents adequately educated. The numbers don't lie. The data speaks for itself. I'm giving you my anecdotal evidence because I've been doing this for 25 years. People, we need to really look at this as a crisis. We need to be more intentional about how we raise our pa families, when we raise our families, you know, how, how we uh, uh, fight for our kids and protect our kids, make sure that they have the best circumstances possible. We cannot continue. Uh, we can't afford another generation of poverty, of teen parenthood, fatherlessness. We can't afford it. Our, 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 our community is being destroyed. And we have to look at this as a crisis and say enough is enough. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I have to stop you there. We are running out of time. Folks, for you that are listening and watching, I need you to share this. Again, I need you to share it with everyone in your network and ask everyone in your network to share it with everyone in theirs. We need to support this bill, Maryland Right to Learn. We need to uh, reach out respectfully to Delegate Atterbury, to who chairs, uh, she chairs the uh, Ways and Means, get that for a vote so you can get out of committee, get to the floor and get it passed. We, we all hope Kerwin will do what it's supposed to do, but until it does, the boost program is what parents have now. So I, I'm hopeful that all of the guests that we had on today especially you, Latoya, will come back. And I could do a whole show just on you, on, on some of the things that you talked about. And I would like to schedule that with a lot more advance notice than you had this time. I, I apologize for that. Not a problem. <laughs> but we, we, folks, we are the solution. We know what the problems are. But what I think too many of you have forgotten is we are the solution. Once you take back your control and your authority to be able to be that solution we were all created to be, we're going to see our communities turn in the directions that we need them to without waiting for an elected to get up on a white horse and ride in and save us. We have the power to do that ourselves. Unfortunately, we are out of time. This is a very important topic. Again, please share, share, share. You can reach out to me directly on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and wherever else, put two cans on a string, however you need to, but please, Share this, be a part of the solution, reach out to Delegate Atterbury, and until we see you again next week, stay safe, stay strong, stay blessed, stay prayed up, keep your eyes open, and stay woke. We'll be back with you next week.
All right, thank you. Just wanted to let you know that the host of this show appreciates the time that you've spent with them. Now, don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe to our channel so you can keep up with everything that we're doing. And most of all, thank you for tuning in to What a Baltimore Online Radio, where the people have the power. <laughs>